15, we're just going to look at the first part of the chapter. <laughs> and again, sometimes it's strange to me as I lay it out and then start studying it. Um, I kind of wonder how it's going to work out. But uh, the parts that we're looking at today, I think, all tie together. And um, hopefully God will direct us in what we need to, to take away uh, for this morning. Um, let's pray and ask him to open our hearts to that. Father, we thank you. There's a lot of material to cover. There's a lot of your word that needs to impact us. Some of it's not easy to, uh, to digest, to, to think through. And so, Father, we pray that you would sharpen our focus, help us to uh, think through uh, what you have for us this morning. And Lord God, uh, most importantly, help us to, to do what you've commanded us to. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Luke chapter 16, we talked about, Jesus said, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. And so how has your life been this week in purposely using what God has given you to impact people for the kingdom of God? Have you used your money? Uh, you, you can't love God and money. What, what, what has a grip on your heart? Uh, is it God? Uh, is it a burden for the lost? Do we, do we, do we think through the fact that, that those in this world who do not know Christ as their Savior are going to end up in hell? And do we realize the immensity of that statement? Um, there's no second chance. The Word of God is sufficient to, to bring the lost uh, to Him. This morning, as we look at John chapter 17, um, <laughs> it's not a, a whole lot easier, okay? Um, Jesus is, again, He's on His way to Jerusalem. He's... Uh, narrowing down the focus. He's teaching his disciples as opposed to the large crowds, although occasionally he, he addresses them as well. But here Jesus says to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. Jesus says, it's impossible that, that you wouldn't sin. But realize that there are consequences to your sin. Take heed to yourselves. You say, well, you stopped in the middle of verse 3. Well, yeah, the numbers aren't inspired, and most of the studying I did shows that the, those uh, statements all need to go together. Um, I had come across uh, this uh, recent poll in... Uh, about two weeks ago, and it kind of ties in with this morning. We are surprisingly not number one. <laughs> um, most sinful states, based on um, violent crimes to excessive drinking to gambling disorders, and they rank Nevada first, primarily because of greed and lust. And Florida comes in second because of jealousy, lust, and vanity. And it goes on to there. And, and so we can rank it uh, collectively, Sin is always personal, and it will always find us out. Um, just uh, the other week, a Minnesota man was eating a hot dog at a hockey game and uh, wiped his mouth with a napkin, tossed the remains in the trash. The authorities were watching him. They picked it up. They used his DNA to tie him to a murder in 1993. All right, your sin will always find you out, whether the police actually find you out or not. God will. Um, and... and so how do we deal with sin? And particularly, we, we read verses like this in 1 John. It says, we know that no one who is born of God sins. Wow, I wish that were true of you. <laughs> right? I wish you didn't sin. I wish I didn't sin. Right? So how, what, what is it? Well, a better 
um, translation of that. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin or does not keep on sinning, all right? And so when we come to Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and when we realize that we are sinners, that we need payment for our sin to be right with God, then there is a change. There has to be a change in our heart. And, and we realize that we're, by sinning, that we're continuing to offend a holy God. And so we can't keep on sinning. It, it, God has placed his spirit in our, in our lives, and, and we realize that, that, that there has to be a change in our attitude towards that which God hates. And so when we sin, and we do sin, when we sin, it grieves our heart like it grieves God's heart, and we desire to get back into fellowship with him. God has given us his spirit within us. We have died to the dominion of sin. All right? Sin doesn't have the power over a Christian that it does over an unsaved person. We have the Spirit of God in us showing us right from wrong. We have uh, the power of Christ, the resurrection in us, uh, enabling us to, to choose the way of escape that God gives during moments of temptation, uh, to choose to do what's right, to avoid sin, right? And, right, but we still struggle with it. Uh, we, we, we choose, unfortunately, uh, to satisfy our selfish desires, to offend a holy God. We don't have to. Romans 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection." knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that first, having been raised from the dead, he who, having been raised, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? So sin is present with us, right? Uh, it is going to come, but we're to live like we should, not committing sin, not seeking sin. That last, the first part of verse 3, the last part that I read there, take heed to yourselves, reminds us that, that we should evaluate ourselves. And so if we're continuing to live in sin, then this warning in First Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 13 should <laughs> ring clear to us. Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. If you're continuing to live in sin, are you truly saved? Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So our lives bear fruit of salvation. There's got to be a change, right? That we avoid sin, we confess sin. If we sin, we, we get right with the person, with God, as quickly as possible. And then Jesus kind of looks at it the other side, right? Second part of verse 3. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. You're like, yes! Yes! Give me a two by four. Unfortunately, 
if you'll study out the word rebuke in Scripture, it is not the harsh word that we've kind of taken it to be. It, it is a matter of coming and, and setting person straight and, and to, to help them to see the error of their ways and, and, and to, to say, look, this is, this is wrong. This is how um, you offended. This is how you sinned. This is, this is where you're heading wrongly, but here's the right way to go. And you come alongside someone and, and you help them, okay? So if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, okay? And that's, that, that was what we looked at as the, the good news, the fun part, right? This is the part that we look at as, oh, really? And if he repents, forgive him. Okay, well, I guess I could do that. Maybe once in a blue moon. But Jesus... <laughs> just tightens it in. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, I shall forgive him. Okay, so how many of you would like to vote that we take that part out? Just, we'll, just, we'll just redact that, okay? It'll never be seen again, right? Because I mean, that's the hard part, right? If we sin against somebody, we want them to forgive us. But surely, surely, when my spouse is on my last nerve for the first time today, I don't want to forgive them. And for the seventh time, I'm thinking about how much I have in the insurance policy. Right? Um, that's not, that's not We're going to deal with sin, but sometimes our sin is unforgiveness, evidently, right? Because our, our heart doesn't, does not want to forgive. And the worst part is this, right? Colossians 3 reminds us of this. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. In Ephesians chapter 4, Reminds us of exactly the same thing. And so given an impossible task, the disciples respond with, well, if that's the way you're going to be, Lord, <laughs> increase our faith. We're going to need a little help with this. Actually, God, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to need a lot of help with this. Yeah, I... <laughs> I don't know what you're, you're, you're thinking, but I, I can't do this. And, and you know, our, our society is really good, right? We, uh, we think that anything that we can't accomplish, we can't be held responsible for, right? Well, you know, uh, my, my employer, he asked for, for a report due, you know, Tuesday, and it's impossible. There's no way I can get all that stuff done. So there's no way he can fire me for that because he gave me an impossible task, right? And, and then we, 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 we go further with that. Well, there is no way that I can love my spouse, so I, I can't be held responsible for that, so we're going to get a divorce. That is our society, right? If... If I can't do it, then it, it's, I can't be held responsible. And so, <laughs> they have been so mean to me, God couldn't possibly hold me responsible for divorce. <laughs> and see, that's not, that's not how Christian life works. That's the way our society works, but that's not the way our Christian life works. The, the disciples' response here is appropriate. Lord, if you're expecting me to forgive people, that's going to have to be done like supernaturally. 
Ding, 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 winner. Yeah, you're right. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. You're not going to be able to do it well. It's almost an impossible thing. And yes, it, it really has to be done in faith, right? So that when somebody offends me, I kind of take a step back and I think, okay, God, you've forgiven me for this and this and this and this and this and this and 20,000 other things that I haven't even considered that are sin against you. Okay, I forgive you. God has forgiven me boatloads of stuff. I can forgive you. Um, I've seen people demonstrate that kind of forgiveness to me. <laughs> what kind of unworthy, unjust servant am I of God that, that I wouldn't turn around and extend that to everybody else? That worries my heart. And I believe that what I've said is true, that faith is required here and that it is a supernatural thing and, and there's, there's much here. And Jesus seems to acknowledge that in, a, in, a, in some respect. <laughs> but what he really takes from that is you're asking for the wrong thing because he doesn't return, turn around and say, Okay, let me increase your faith. Which I would think is a lot like praying for patience. Not really something that you want to do because the way God usually works on your patience is to make you wait, make you see the value of waiting. And if you're asking for faith, I have a feeling that the way God would answer that is to make you see how much faith you still really need. And, you know, um, but they ask for faith, and Jesus doesn't say, boom, more faith, you've got it, right? Because that's not the way God works. He works in us. What Jesus replies is, guys, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith. <laughs> if you have faith as a mustard seed, if you have faith as like the tiniest grain of, of anything, you, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I picture a raspberry bush, which I think I could almost pull out of our garden if I wanted to. Right? But mulberry trees tend to grow like for 600 years and their root system is amazingly complex and very deep. And, and the, the disciples would have known that. And it's like, you ain't getting that thing out of there. Right? Um, but Jesus is saying, if I've got the little, tiny little faith, I can say to the mulberry tree, pick up your 600-year root system and just go into the sea, and it would do it. Right? And Jesus is saying, guys, believe it or not, it doesn't take as much faith as you think to forgive people. What it really takes is obedience <laughs> to do what God has told you to do. And tells the story. Which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? Now, now we're thinking, well, that would be very nice. To the Jew, that's like, what? You would tell your servant who's come in from the field, hey, looks like you've had a hard day. Go take a bath, relax. Half an hour, supper's on, let me serve you. And it's like, impossible okay this breaks every everything in their thinking come at once sit down to eat but shall he not rather say to him prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till i've eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink i see you've had a hard day why isn't supper already on the table does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him i think not so likewise, you, when you've done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what is our duty to do. And uh, one of the 
the commentator said it, it would be like in our society if Jesus were speaking now, he would probably uh, say something like, um, which of you coming to April 15th files his taxes exactly as he's supposed to, attaches a check for the right amount, and sends it to the IRS, but expects that what he's going to get back from the IRS is a party for having done exactly what he was supposed to do and had the President of the United States host the party because you did what you were supposed to do. You paid your taxes by April 15th. Yeah! And you're all going, right, like Trump's going to show up at a party for me for paying my taxes. You're right. It's probably not going to happen. If it does, make sure to invite the rest of us. But it's probably not going to happen. Why? Because the IRS isn't about rewarding you for doing exactly what you were told you had to do. It's a responsibility, and you're supposed to do it. Now, should you neglect to do your responsibility, you might expect a visit from the IRS, all right? But they're not there to throw you a party. <laughs> Jesus says, look, you are my servants. And you're supposed to, you're supposed to do exactly what I've told you to do. Forgive. Walk in light. Avoid sin. Now, that seems kind of harsh. <laughs> and as I thought about it, I thought, I don't like that. It's not the way I picture Jesus. It's not the way I picture God. And to an extent, what I'm about to tell you is true, that that's, that's not the full picture. But that is definitely a part of the picture. That we are God's servants. We are God's slaves. And truthfully, what he should expect what we should expect is that we would do our duty. And he would say, nothing, because you did your duty. Fortunately, that's not all that Scripture tells us, though, right? God is a gracious God. And, and that he, he rewards, he, well done, thou good and faithful servant, which is really kind of odd in a, in a Jewish mindset. Big deal, you did what you were supposed to do. Well done, now good and faithful servant. And Jesus goes, no longer do I call you slaves, but I have called you friend. Right? <laughs> Which, at first I'm thinking, yeah, it's because you know, Jesus is my best friend. And like, listen to the, the, um, the context of John 15, though, okay? Um, John 15, that part, four, verse 14, starts out with, you are my friends if you do what I commanded you. So whether you're going to be a slave or a friend of Jesus, you still have to obey, right? It's not like, well, I, I don't have to do what Jesus tells me to do because he's my best friend and he'll understand. We have a lot of that in our, in our society, right? God will understand. He, he's, he's, you are my friends if you do what I commanded you to do. And I no longer just call you slaves, but I also call you friend. And what John 15 reveals is, is that the reason that Jesus, or the way Jesus re defines this is the slave does not know what his master is doing. But... Jesus has revealed, at least partially, his purposes in, 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 in commanding us to do certain things. Now, we're going to come to the Sunday school story. 
Oh, before we do that, see that Luke 17, which is only two chapters away from Luke 15, so hopefully you haven't forgotten, right? You got the prodigal son, and, and the father doesn't just treat his son who comes back as a slave. He treats him as a son, right? And so, so God doesn't just treat us as slaves. He calls us friend. He treats us as sons. But, okay, um, unfortunately in our society, right, um, there, there, are, there are some advantages um, to the closeness and, and intimacy and, and relaxing of, of some of our social structure. Um, it was funny when uh, I went to college in the South, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, things are done a little bit differently in the, in the South, okay? And I, I didn't see all of it, but one of the things that, that really struck me um, was that for a while I was in a, a Bible club ministry, and, uh, you know, we would go out, college students would go out, uh, different homes, and they would bring in kids, and uh, you know, you'd tell them like five day clubs and CEF and, and things like that. But the, the part of the story that impacts this is, I, I remember the the young lady who we had um, club at her house, and she was a student. Uh, she was a senior, I believe, at the time I was a freshman, and so we we went to her house uh, to set up this club and, and and every time she talked to her dad she called him sir i mean like without exception All right um and it's not that she didn't love her dad and that, not that her dad didn't love her but there was an air of respect <laughs> that was very evident right in in the older southern culture, right? You, you know, you didn't just go running. She didn't, as far as I know, ever call him daddy, right? Sir. And in some ways, uh, is there love there? Yes, but, but in some ways, we, we can't melt it down and, and, and just remove God from who God is, right? And that he... He has done immense things for us, right? So we come to this story. Don't lose it because you think you know it and you've heard it in Sunday school, all right? Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem. Again, he's on his, on his way, um, but this is probably not necessarily in uh, chronological order. Luke is pulling us together because it applies to this topic. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem, they passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. All right, so Luke chapter 5, I believe it was, Jesus had met a leper, and he had done the unthinkable, he reached out and he touched him and he healed him, all right? And I explained to you then that it, we, we wouldn't want to put pictures on the screen of, of lepers because it would just give us all nightmares, okay? This is a horrible, disfiguring disease. You lose the sensitivity, the nerves, and for the most part, you do damage to yourself because you just can't feel what's going on. Rats can gnaw off your fingers while you sleep and it would never wake you up because you have no, no, you put your hand on a hot burning stove, reach into fire and you can do it. It'll do irreparable more damage, but you can do it because you just have no feeling in your, uh, in your body. All right. And it progressively gets worse. And, um, 
even your voice, it's raspy. And, and so these guys calling out to Jesus is, is something all and of its own. They call out to Jesus and they ask him to have mercy on them. They're social outcasts. They can't go home. They, they have to live separate. It's a, uh, it, it spreads, and they, they, they wanted the, the Jews wanted nothing to do with that, so they're cut off from society. And so when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. Why? Well, because if you were cured, that never happened, <laughs> If by a miracle God would heal you, you would have to go to the priests and you'd have to show yourself to them. They would examine you and, and say, wow, God has done the miraculous here. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. So they showed faith, right? Here they are, lepers, sores, no feeling. They ask for mercy from Jesus. They, they actually call him Lord, which is kind of un unusual. They're not his disciples. They've evidently heard of who he is, and they, they say, have mercy on us. He says, go show yourselves to the priest, which they understood. What that meant was, <laughs> you're going to be healed? Because they weren't while they were standing there. And so they show faith. We'll trust that God, that, that this man, this Lord, this, this great man sent from God has the power to heal us. If he says, go show yourselves. We're going to go show ourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned. And with a loud voice, okay, again, so he no longer has the rasp of the leper, right? He, he's shouting and glorifying God because he has been made whole, right? He's restored to complete health immediately, totally. He returned with a loud voice and glorified God. He fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. He worships the Savior. He worships the Messiah. Why? Because he is the power of God. And he's, he's, he's graciously healed this man who couldn't have any contact with his family. He's restored to him a life. He's given him a life better than the life that he had. And he comes back and he thanks God. He, he praises him. He worships I and mean, he was a Samaritan. That gets thrown in. <laughs> so Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? He said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Does anyone have a different ending to that verse? Whole? Okay. Um, it actually would be better to be translated, your faith has saved you. The, the word there is sozo. It's the it's Greek word used for, for salvation. So not only has he been made physically well, Right? But his faith in coming back and glorifying and worshiping has, has saved him. Right? He's, he's placed his trust in the correct one. And he's acknowledging who Christ is. Now, in some ways, though this happened, this is an event, Jesus using this to show, to set up what's about to happen, that Israel is going to reject their Messiah, and it will be the Gentiles who come to him, right? That's, we're about to see that keep building in Luke. 
But also, this applies to what we've just looked at. That we've been forgiven much. Are we grateful for that? Has it given us such an attitude of gratitude that when someone sins against us, that our first response when they come to us and they repent is to say, I forgive you completely, fully. And that when they come the second time, third time, fifth, sixth, seventh time in a day, that we are so grateful for what God has done for us. are willing to say, yeah, I'll forgive you. I think you need counseling, right? Rebuke. I think we need to work through this, but I will forgive you. I don't know what you're going to come away necessarily from with this week. <laughs> I know that for me, I, I need to cry out like the disciples. Lord God, increase my faith. Right? Increase my trust in you. Increase my willingness to say that whatever you say is best and I kind of trust that. That whatever you say is best. So that if you say, forgive, I forgive. If you say, avoid sin, I, I, I will trust that you have given me the, the strength and, and the, the power to be able to say, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to offend. I'm not going to sin. Lord, help me to trust that what you say is is best, is right, is true. In matters of forgiveness and in matters of thankfulness. Lord, help me to understand better what I've been forgiven. How you, God, have forgiven me. How others have graciously forgiven me. Help me to live in an attitude of gratitude. Help me to live in such a way that it's obvious that I am grateful for God's grace in my life. Let's pray. Father God, you are indeed a gracious, holy, loving God. Uh, help us to be very mindful of that, Lord. Help us to see and to remember what it is that you've forgiven us of. Father, help us to realize your power, that if you can cure a leper, that you can cure a sinner, that, Father, that you can give new life and life that is not dominated by sin, but life that is walking in the light as you are in the light. And Father, help us to live a life of gratefulness. May it impact us in our actions and our attitudes, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just to uh, remind you of a few things, uh, we're going to end our service with uh, a commissioning and then a song. But... Uh, Today, MAPS kids are meeting, the Folds meeting. We're having our evening service and invite you back to that. Um, baby bottles uh, for the raising money for the Pregnancy Resource Center, uh, one of our missions organizations. Those are due today. If for some reason you weren't able to, if you could get it back next week, that would be really helpful. Uh, prayer meetings, the WANA uh, going on. Uh, next week, you get to lose an hour of sleep. Yay! Um, 
but uh, we will. Uh, our, our family is uh, is heading south because we just have had enough snow. Um, we're, we're heading south for a week. <laughs> yes, it's true. Um, and uh, but Pastor Brandon will be sharing and uh, how you can grow in God's Word next week. Uh, there is still one small group sign up uh, out on the bulletin board if you would take. Uh, advantage of that. There's other things there in your bulletin. Um, we did get uh, a, a note from Bruce, uh, Bruce Kimmy in, uh, in the Ukraine. They have arrived. Uh, they actually had church. They're seven hours ahead of us, and so they've already had church this morning. They're, uh, they'll have uh, seven hours would put them at, uh, oh, they're actually in their evening service. Their evening service starts early over there uh, this evening. Uh, Bruce is helping to lead worship for the evening service, and they have a full week uh, of helping uh, the ministry there at the church that helps uh, the special needs. Um, and then uh, Brian and Donna are heading out uh, to El Salvador uh, here uh, in a very short time. And so we're going to ask them to come into the, the middle of uh, the sanctuary here and ask you to come around them. And uh, we're just going to pray that God would give them wisdom and clarity uh, that as they go, that they be, have opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to everyone they meet, that the right things would be in the right places at the right time, like wheelchairs and tools and everything that you can imagine that can go wrong has gone wrong on a wheelchair distribution. But God is supernaturally sovereign over all. Pray that he would give them wisdom if the right things that they think are right, aren't there, that they would have the wisdom and grace to see what God is trying to do, okay? Let's gather around them, we'll pray, and then uh, when we're done, we'll finish with a song. Uh, Kevin Devine, would you mind starting off our time of prayer? If you'd like to pray, we can pray briefly, and then I'll close.
Lord God, you're good. Thank you for the number of people that you raise up from within our congregation willing to serve abroad, willing to serve outside of our congregation. Lord God, we pray that you would uh, bless Brian and Donna in particular, that you would uh, give them wisdom, uh, help them as they make the final preparations, as uh, things for the, the team uh, pull together uh, in this last week. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, the right things being in the right place at the right time. Uh, Lord, we pray for your spirit to go in advance. Uh, Father, that, uh, that you would gain the honor and the glory from all that is done as the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented, that people will respond and be saved from hell. Father, we pray for those who are believers, that they would be strengthened in their faith and that their gratitude towards you would be magnified. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name.